I'm delighted to introduce our co-hosting organization, the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative. With us today is Outreach Director Cassandra Sennell and Executive Director Brigitte Miranda Freer. Today's virtual event will offer insights and strategies based on the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative's half decade of helping leaders across Montana navigate evolving workforce needs. At the end of this session, we will unveil a brand new resource guide related to Montana's bioscience industry, so stay tuned for more. And I'm now pleased to introduce our moderator, Nicole Rush, Deputy Director of the Missoula Economic Partnership and a Bioscience Workforce Specialist. Nicole will provide an overview of Montana's bioscience industry, current trends and predictions in hiring, occupations and skills, and discuss new initiatives and opportunities. And toward the end of our webinar, Nicole will moderate a short conversation with Karen Brown, founder of Clio Research, to provide an industry perspective on workforce needs and also discuss, discuss a key new initiative at the University of Montana. Um, we will have time at the end of the presentation for audience questions. If you have questions for our speakers during the program, feel free to type them in the chat. And I would now like to turn the floor over to Nicole to get us started. Thank you, Christina. And good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today. And um, yeah, and on behalf of the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative, I want to thank uh, Christina and her team at the High Tech Alliance for hosting this webinar and for your partnership over the last few years for all the work that you do to advance the high tech sector in Montana. I'm going to pause a moment just to share my slides. Hopefully everybody can see those. Okay. Um, yeah, so hi, my name is Nicole Rush. I'm the Deputy Director at Missoula Economic Partnership, and I'm a member of the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative, um, which is a, a statewide coalition that formed back in 2019. Um, it's formed of six different organizations, and we're all uh, partnering and working in different ways to help grow the bioscience sector in Montana. So my, um, my co-members of our of our coalition include the Montana Bioscience Alliance, the Montana World Trade Center, the University of Montana, Montech, which is our technology business incubator here in Missoula, and Swan Valley Medical, which is our, our private industry partner, um, on a medical device manufacturer that's based in Big Fork. And um, together, we six organizations work on a lot of different aspects of economic development in bioscience in Montana, um, ranging from uh, helping attract new companies to the state, securing more foreign direct investment, uh, representing um, and advocating for the industry at national and even international trade shows, um, providing mentorship and small grants to entrepreneurs, and of course, through the technology incubator, providing um, lab space and uh, space for operations. So, um, and uh, the other aspect of the cluster initiative is that we've been working since 2019. We're funded through the Small Business Administration and we are, we are now at the very end of our contract. And um, so we are, we are winding down our work and, um, and really reflecting back on what we've learned as partners over the last five years of um, working with this incredible industry. And, um, and that's kind of the purpose of this webinar today is to, um, to share some of the, some of the strategies and, um, and the impacts uh, in the world of workforce, um, to share some trends and some um, data, recent data, as well as data we've collected over the years um, some in partnership with the High Tech Alliance, and um, and uh, really highlight some new initiatives and new opportunities that we think will continue to help this industry grow um, in the years to come. And with that, I will. Let me advance the slide. There we go. <laughs> so yeah. So um, this is my agenda this morning. Uh, I wanted to give you kind of an overview of, um, of the sector in Montana, talk about the workforce needs, especially the, the skills and occupations that are in the highest demand here in Montana, 
talk about um, the the educational initiatives and partnerships that um, are are so impactful in the world in in the work of advancing the workforce in bioscience and highlight some uh, future opportunities. And then after about 25 minutes of that, we will hear from uh, Dr. Karen Brown uh, with Clio Research. Um, and Karen uh, is a great, uh, will provide an industry partner perspective on workforce development, as well as highlight um, a new research and commercialization initiative that she um, is part of and that recently secured an award um, through the NIH uh, at the University of Montana. And um, Christina and team, just so you know, I did just talk to Karen and there's a little bit of trouble with the internet at UM this morning, <laughs> I guess. So she will she will be getting on if she's not already on. Um, I think she just joined us, Nicole. Great, awesome. <laughs> okay. So with that, I will, oh, and we'll, so after we hear from Karen, we'll um, we'll have hopefully a little time for Q&A. So with that, I'll jump right into my overview of the industry. Um, I always like to start by defining what I'm talking about when I say the bioscience industry or the bioscience sector in Montana. And it's really actually a diverse, diverse industry sector that includes many different types of companies, functions, occupations, and careers. Um, but it's kind of made up of five main subsectors. And, um, and those include agricultural and industrial biosciences, the manufacturing and development of drugs and pharmaceuticals, manufacturing and development of medical devices and equipment, um, research testing and medical laboratories, which I think is what most of us kind of think of when we think of bioscience and biotech are people in white coats in a lab. Um, and that definitely includes these folks. Um, and then bioscience related distribution, which is uh, kind of the companies that work on selling and distributing the drugs and pharmaceuticals and the medical devices and equipment that are manufactured <laughs> under the sector. So, um, so there's a lot of diversity here. And, um, and that creates a lot of diversity in the, um, in the workforce and in the occupations that, um, that people can enter into in this industry. Um, so that's the what I mean when I say bioscience, and this is the where. Where is it concentrated in Montana? This is a map that shows um, the concentration of payroll business locations in Montana. And the counties that have more businesses are, are darker colored. And you can see that bioscience in Montana is, is definitely driven and very centered around um, our flagship our academic institutions at MSU and the University of Montana. Um, and um, and it's, so it's concentrated there and in our centers of population. Um, we also have centers of research in Hamilton and in Great Falls that drive bioscience innovation and commercialization and um, help uh, scientists spin off companies. Um, and, then, uh, and then also I think there's a strong relationship in Montana between our healthcare sector and bioscience. And so population centers that have centers of healthcare will also tend to have uh, people working in bioscience and bioscience companies. So that's what and where. And then next I'm gonna talk about, because we framed this webinar in terms of trends, I thought I would kind of go through the three main trends that we see um, in, the work, in the bioscience workforce and how we expect them to continue over the next few years. I think sometimes when we say the word trends, I tend to think of fashion and, um, and you know, things like, skinny jeans are out and um, trends in the workforce don't move that quickly um, as, as trends in fashion. And um, although there can be huge disruptions, of course, and the pandemic definitely um, made big changes in the bioscience workforce and definitely accelerated the industry's growth. So, there, so sometimes things can shift pretty quickly, but overall, um, I think you'll see from from these three trends that these are these are ongoing trends, so not not huge surprises here. Um, the first main trend is that we do expect to see continued rapid growth and hiring in the bioscience sector in Montana. Um, this is a chart um, from a report that uh, we commissioned from the uh, Bureau of Business and Economic Research at the University of Montana. 
Um, and it and I like to show this just because it shows kind of why we formed the cluster initiative in the first place back in 2018, 2019. You really see the sharp growth in employment in the bioscience sector in Montana relative to the private sector. Um, it's really grown a lot faster in employment and just in the years leading up to 2020. And that trend has continued um, in the past few years and we expected to continue to grow a lot. Um, this chart is shows a longer timeline and goes all the way back to 2001, projects into 2033. Um, but, but really we're kind of looking at um, the past five years here. And you can really see the, the big growth in the industry in Montana. We've grown employment about 21% in bioscience since 2018. I also want to point out that this is still a small industry in Montana. <laughs> um, it, it, it does, it has a small number of employees relative to some of our other bigger industries. Um, my economic development folks on the call will know, but, um, but it has huge potential, um, both in terms of fast growth and in terms of high wages. Um, in terms of employment, uh, just to break it down, um, this, this chart, this is again from our 2022 report, 2022 report with BBER, this just shows the employment in the different types of subsectors in bioscience. Um, by far the most employees are in pharmaceutical and medical manufacturing, and then medical equipment um, and supplies. This is medical equipment wholesalers, that's that distribution of um, devices and pharmaceuticals, diagnostic laboratories, and R&D is actually our smallest, um, one of our smallest employment concentrations. Agricultural and, and industrial biosciences as a subsector does not have a strong presence in Montana. There are a few companies, but, um, but it's actually one of the subsectors that has uh, seen a decline in, in growth um, over the last few years. Um, here's another chart that just kind of shows the growth of employment relative to those different subsectors um, leading up to 2020. And you can kind of just see um, see how R&D has grown, pharmaceutical, pharmaceuticals have really grown, equipment wholesalers really grown. There's the decline in agricultural and industrial there just in 2019 to 2020. In terms of wages, um, this chart is actually slightly old. It's again from 2022 based on 2021 data. So the wages have actually grown even more, but um, I kind of like it because it shows the, the different average wages across the subsectors. And um, the reason that we, we really focus on bioscience as a great uh, industry with potential for development it are these high wages, um, the fast growth and then these are really, really excellent wages and careers that, um, that Montanans can access by entering this sector. Um, and I think the average wage is now actually over $100,000 a year as of 2023. Um, and, and those wages will continue to grow. This chart is from a recent report um, uh, released by the Coalition of State Bioscience Initiatives and Techonomy, so it's a national report that surveys uh, industry CEOs and asks for their perspective on workforce trends. And I, um, I've drawn quite a few charts from this report in, in this presentation, um, and it, it's got some great information. So this really shows that almost 40% of companies um, gave wage increases of more than 10% in the last year. And, and the reasons why, um, the, the two factors are mostly competition for talent and then inflation, which has driven wages up across the board. Um, but uh, and then remote work being the least um, important factor ranked by the folks who filled out this survey. So wages are continuing to increase pretty steadily, and that's a trend we expect to continue as well. Um, here's another way to look at growth of the sector. Uh, this, this map shows um, Montana's growth relative to the nation as a whole in other states. So we were sixth in growth um, from 2015 to 2020. So we are growing um, our industry faster than the national average, um, which is awesome. And then, uh, and then finally, this is another chart that just shows the employment growth trends relative to the private sector just in the last couple of years. So the industry as a whole is growing 
uh, much faster than the private sector, another trend we expect to continue. So overall, this industry will continue to grow. It offers really high wages, and that creates a steady demand for a skilled workforce that includes all types of skills, but is heavily concentrated on those with um, at least a background um, and some credentials in STEM. Um, so who is employed in the bioscience industry? What are the occupations? This chart just shows the breakdown of, of occupations in, in those employees. So um, most in Montana, most um, people are employed in production occupations related to manufacturing, scientists and um, science related occupations take second place. Then you see all of the other occupations are, are kind of maybe non-technical roles that would be well informed by having a technical background for sure, especially if you're in management and you're managing a team of scientists, you probably need to know some science, but um, but that might not be all, you know, all the skills and credentials you need. There's certainly a need for office and administrative support, support teams, and then sales is also a huge need for this sector. And then finally, some folks are employed at bioscience firms who have um, architecture and engineering or um, just a whole other completely different set of skills. So there's a wide, um, wide variety of occupations in bioscience and um, uh, people can enter into the industry with a lot of different types of credentials. So what kind of um, jobs are bioscience companies in Montana looking for? Or what kind of skills are they posting for? This chart shows um, just the skills that are in job ads that are scraped off the internet just in the last year. Um, and you, so you can kind of see the even just in the last year or so, the, the rise of, of different emphasis on certain types of skills. Of course, office equipment will be a skill for in every job posting because <laughs> every job requires a computer these days, along with you know medical records and such. But um, let's see the, the big emphasis on pharmaceuticals, on the need for skills in uh, running clinical trials, chronic product project management, um, and then and then notice uh, nursing, um, healthcare, you know, related skills. Um, there's a lot of crossover between healthcare and bioscience, of course, especially in the world of medical device development and manufacturing. So that's the job postings. We've also surveyed the industry to ask what skills they most want. This is from our 2022 survey that um, completed with BBR and in partnership with the High Tech Alliance. Um, we didn't get a great response to this survey, so it's not a very, very robust survey, but I do think is it is reflective of the skills that um, people in the industry most um, tell me that they want. Uh, lab skills really come out on, on top, um, along with kind of basic biology or genetics, medical knowledge, science and math, of course, and then going on down um, into more um, you know, more of what we might call soft or employability skills like work ethic and writing or editing, which all employers tend to say that they want. Um, and I and I wanted to, to show that just to kind of emphasize that this is an industry where um, STEM, uh, STEM is of course heavily emphasized and valued. And, um, and I think that holds true even for the positions in bioscience um, even if they don't require a four-year degree, um, you still they still want to see uh, you know a strong um, background and interest and study of science, of course. Um, and this chart just kind of shows that relative to other industries, why how much more heavily weighted that is in the bioscience sector. Third trend, um, in bioscience, I think possibly more than almost any other industry in Montana is so um, so driven by academic and industry partnerships. Um, and in Montana, especially many of our fastest growing bioscience companies such as uh, Inimmune, for example, are come from that research and academic place and have those strong partnerships within our university system. And many employees you know, wear both hats of being a researcher and um, and a and a researcher in the industry as well. 
Um, so, so that's the third trend that we'll continue to see is that there's this just this continued emphasis and importance on partner on the partnership between education and the industry, and that's at the four year level, but it goes all the way down into K twelve. Um, and and this is where I um, shift gears and talk a little bit about um, the two kind of uh, workforce initiatives that we at the bioscience cluster initiative um, see as the most uh, important areas for investment when it comes to workforce development in the state of Montana. Um, and, and both of these uh, initiatives relate more to uh, steering students toward um, growing their skills in STEM at the high school or even before high school level, um, as well as raising awareness about the potential for taking a job in this industry early on in, in, their, um, in their schooling. Um, so before they ever um, get to college, uh, students should know about um, their the potential to have a great career in this industry. Um, and uh, so one one credential that we'd really love to see more widely adopted in Montana, although it is already um, in use, is the Biotechnician Assistant Credentialing Exam or BASE. Uh, this is a national industry recognized exam that um, has pretty quickly spread across the nation and is um, becoming more and more widely adopted and in, and in use in many, many states. Um, and you can see from the map, it, it started um, out of the University of Southern Florida and, uh, and their um, and a, an organization there called Biotility that, that developed the exam and advocates for its use industry wide. Um, and so you see that, you know, many states have adopted BASE as a, um, an educational credential. It can be offered in high school or at the two year college level. Um, and it prepares uh, workers for with kind of all the basic skills they need to start work in a lab, you know, at, at, at an entry level position. Um, I won't read this slide, but you can kind of see some of the skills that are taught in the practical and the knowledge exam and why they're so relevant to the industry. Um, shout out here to Flathead Valley Community College. And I know um, some folks from there are on this call today. Um, FVCC has implemented the base and seen um, some great success with uh, with their students having them take the exam. In Missoula, we're we're definitely teaching in schools to the skills, um, to, to, you know, preparing students to be able to take the base, even though it's not um, like widely offered. Um, and and I think uh, Bitterroot College is also. Uh, working on um, using and teaching to the base. So the base is an important credential that I think we as a, as a cluster initiative would like to see spread and taught and taken more widely across the whole state um, to prepare more entry-level workers for careers. Um, the second aspect of workforce development work that can be hugely impactful is just um, making sure that students are aware of the all the career opportunities available to them in bioscience and healthcare. And so that's been um, a part of our work as a cluster initiative is to um, to hold events for students. So this this shows one that's been going on in Billings um, that um, that has been planned through the MSUB and the Bioscience Alliance for the last few years, I think I want to say the last three or four years possibly. Um, it's a full one day uh, summit um, of high school students where they can learn about career opportunities in healthcare, which of course has a lot of crossover with bioscience and they do emphasize um, life, life science careers in general. Um, in Missoula, we, we have a similar um, program, but we don't do it in one day. We divide it into a series of lectures for high school students where they go and hear from different professionals in, in healthcare and biotech. Um, and they get extra credit if they attend and pizza. So, um, so yeah, so that kind of career pathway of work, it, it work at the K-12 level is so important. And those kind of initiatives are, um, are hugely valuable and we would really like to see them carried forward. I know that um, in my work at Missoula Economic Partnership, we'll continue to, to organize and support um, these type of events and activities. Um, and then, 
finally, when it comes to um, seeing the work carried forward, um, as we look at, you know, kind of ending our contract with the SBA and, um, and kind of who's going to take on different aspects of cluster work and also new initiatives that will, um, and then maybe they're not fully 100% centered in the bioscience sector, but they will have an impact in advancing STEM fields in Montana overall. And so I wanted to highlight some of them before we uh, chat with Karen here. Um, and one of those is a new cluster initiative, relatively new. It started about a year and a half ago, um, and it's based in Spokane, Washington, called the Evergreen Bioscience Innovation Cluster. Um, this is a project that's funded through the Washington Department of Commerce, and, um, and it is centered in Spokane, but they, they have included the Mountain Northwest in, the, in their mission, so including Northern Idaho and Western Montana. And, um, and it is a kind of a membership model um, and advocacy group, but they do have a strong workforce emphasis. I've participated on their um, talent development committee for the last year, and, um, and they are really looking to ramp up those types of um, career awareness activities and at the middle school and high school level, um, create more opportunities for students to learn about careers as well as um, advocate for the industry and as a whole, similar um, to what we've been doing uh, here in Montana. So that's that's an organization to watch and um, and take advantage of their their work. Um, the other the other kind of new opportunities I wanted to discuss were just the incredible tranche of federal funding that is um, currently being deployed, um, driving economic development in different um, science and technology related fields. One of those is the National Science Foundation Engines Award, which um, UM is currently implementing. Uh, that centers around um, advancing economic um, activities and development and um, new technologies in forestry mainly, but um, forestry is uh, is definitely adjacent to bioscience, um, certainly, and it's it's you know a discipline of life science in and of itself, um, and can be so so that type of activity um, is something to watch in the future. Um, the other the other big program that I'm super excited about right now is. Um, our designation uh, in Western Montana of the Headwaters uh, Tech Hub, which is focused on um, becoming, creating a globally uh, competitive photonics industry in Montana. Um, that project will divide, will, you know, potentially multi-million dollars of funding um, coming through the Economic De Development Administration that will, um, and will certainly drive a lot of dollars toward workforce development and innovation centered around photonics mainly, but, um, but in terms of occupations and careers and the needs for people with skills in different STEM backgrounds, I think this can only be a benefit to the bioscience sector um, that, we, that we will have this, um, hopefully this huge investment um, in our kind of science and technology workforce development system centered around our universities, but definitely not limited to them. And looking at how we drive uh, more people, especially from underrepresented populations um, in Montana, folks who haven't been able to access tech degrees or tech careers um, and driving them into, into these uh, jobs. And then finally, kind of in the same um, sort of category, is, um, is a new initiative uh, at the University of Montana uh, focused on research and commercialization um, in, in uh, healthcare that is um, being led by Karen Brown. And so I'll, um, I think I'll stop my slide sharing now and introduce Karen. Hey, Karen. Um, so Karen is an entrepreneur and a scientist, and she founded Clio Research back in 2019. And that's a contract research organization that um, provides a wide variety of consulting support for biotech companies in our state. And um, Karen herself is also a research scientist and completed her doctor of pharmacy from the UM uh, School of Pharmacy in 2020. And then her fellowship in 2022 with Dr. Erica Woodall, who's the other co-principal investigator for this new REACH Award. So hi, Karen. Thanks so much for being here. 
Thanks for having me, Nicole, and thanks for that introduction. Uh, I apologize for being late and the tech issues that I've ran into, but I am excited to be here today and, and talk a little bit about the Ellis Skaggs Institute for Health Innovation Research Evaluation and Commercial Specialization Hub. Um, this was recently awarded to us here at the University of Montana. We were only one of five um, universities to be awarded this, this um, grant from the NIH, and we're excited to be launching our first cohort in spring of 2024. But basically, um, the aim of the, the REACH Hub is to accelerate biomedical innovation to commercialization. And so we're working with um, biomedical innovators to bring them the resources, um, the project management support, and, and the funding to get them closer to um, something like follow-on funding, whether that be a successful SBIR or STTR application or some venture me mechanism. Um, and bringing in some of my uh, experience working as um, or leading a contract research organization, um, conducting clinical trials for medical device and biotech companies, and working directly with the FDA or other regulatory bodies. I think this is something that I've been really excited about for years uh, in terms of economic development here in the region. Um, uh, the Sci High Reach Award has been um, really exciting. It's something that we are really looking forward to um, kind of bringing a lens to it that um, is is based on trying to more broadly um, provide resources to to innovators. So we're able to partner with universities and colleges, um, whether that be techno technological colleges or, or tribal or community colleges to support these innovators um, across a four state region. So we uh, will be looking for applications in February of 2024 and um, be able to support four to six projects, um, whether, um, in kind of that translational phase, if a company has a company or an innovator has an invention disclosure and some early data validation, um, we're here to bring in those resources and expertise to get them closer to that commercialization line. It's really cool and it's, it's so awesome to see. And thank you for all of your work. Um, and maybe you could talk more a little bit about your, you know, your kind of history of working in bioscience and your kind of you know, you kind of wear two hats, both as an entrepreneur and a, and a researcher. And maybe you could go a little bit into your, your story and about Clio research as well. Yeah, absolutely. I loved what you said earlier about how, how intertwined healthcare professions are with bioscience trends. And so, you know, while I don't run a, a biotech company like Inimmune, I, I work with a lot of these companies very closely. And I see how much need there is for clinical research professionals to help help get these products to patients and, and um, iterate the process for them and iterate the drug development process or the de device development process. Um, and so I see um, a lot of need in terms of the hospital settings that run these clinical trials or even private research settings uh, requiring people who have a little bit of background in that medical um, and that medical or healthcare piece and, and being able to work with patients to, to get them in, in clinical trials. Um, I personally just running a contract research organization and working with others see a huge need for more clinical research associates. So, so um, people who are actually going out to these clinical research sites and uh, taking a look at the data, making sure, kind of getting really intimate close to the data to see how it's affecting populations and um, and making sure that it's safe and effective for for patients more broadly um, and and I've I've worked in that area for a number of years now and so I think that my um, my lens is more so on that clinical research professional and how how we can create programs and and partnerships with the university systems to get more, more people down that, that route. Yeah. And I mean, to that end, um, you kind of already spoke to this, but, but how, 
how does this intersect with talent and development and kind of like thinking about it, you know, holistically from um, even looking at, you know, like the K-12 system, what, what sort of skills and credentials do you think are most in demand and should be um, uh, emphasized in Montana in the years to come, given with your experience? Um, you know, I think that um, a lot of the the skills that come down to kind of success in in the clinical research professional are more of those soft skills. Um, uh, being able to work with people, being able to kind of um, have some of those motivational interviewing skills or sales skills, as you noted before, um, and just having a baseline background in science to know like what this means to be able to bring these products to patients and and the importance of of understanding the safety and efficacy behind them. Yeah, I, I totally agree. We have a lot of partners from, you know, our education and, and government and economic development on the call today. So, um, you know, as someone who's who's in the field and actively doing this work, how can how can we support you? What kind of um, what kind of new programs or initiatives should be developed to to support your work and the industry as a whole? You know, I think we have a great example. I was talking to a couple of people about this um, last week uh, um, with ATG and, and the business um, arrangements that they made with the University of Montana to kind of drive some of that workforce development and, and some of those more private partnerships. I think there are actually a number of clinical research sites and, and probably a number of um, contract research organizations that would be interested in, in doing a similar arrangement. Um, we hosted a really fantastic um, symposium a couple months ago, all based on access to clinical trials in rural communities. And a number of our speakers were from the hospital systems around Montana, and they were speaking to, you know, the need to just have some training in clinical research uh, for a clinical research professional to be able to come in the door and and work with data and and understand kind of the regulatory piece, um, understand the timelines and and how strict and um, how necessary it is to have clean data for these companies. Um, and also develop, like I said earlier, the those soft skills of being able to talk to a patient and and go through the informed consent process with them, and and really better understand what it means to participate in a clinical trial. Because I think if we're going to bring some of these biomedical innovations to rural or or tribal communities, we really do need to understand where they're at now and what the perceptions are for them in terms of clinical trials and bridge that gap. To, to the point where they feel comfortable being able to um, share biospecimens, share data, um, and and contribute to science in this way. I'm sorry, I didn't give you this on, on the prepared list of questions, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. What's kind of an example of the types of projects that you, that you hope to see when you open that application and maybe speaking to that, um, that rural or tribal partnership potential? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, we're a very unique university to get this award. Um, the other universities that were awarded in this cohort are Vanderbilt, Texas A&M, um, Northwestern University in Chicago. And so something that I've experienced just running Clio um, is that a lot of companies want to understand if their product works in a, in a really geographically um, expand, expansive region. Um, so, um, I think it would be great to kind of set the stage and, and be able to support companies or innovators in terms of learning, you know, when you have a comprehensive stroke center, that's this far away from that has to support this broad of a, of a radius, um, like we see, uh, at Billings clinic, what kind of devices make sense or or what kind of interventions make sense um, that can actually support the population that we see um, in Montana. Well, thanks, Karen. Is there anything else you wanted to add that I didn't ask you about before we transition into Q&A? 
No, I think this is a really exciting program. Like I said, we we're just getting it off the ground, but we we're hoping to get our first round of applications in in, in February, and and we're just excited to be growing this this industry here in Montana. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much for all of your work. You're, you've been a really great partner to us over the last few years, and appreciate all of your you're always willing to come out and talk to students and. Um, participate in in events and um, have such a great personal story to share as well. So um, I think with that, Christina, we'll maybe open it up to questions. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, we can have, if folks want to type a question into the chat, you're welcome to do that. But you also should have the ability to unmute yourself. So if you would like, if anyone would like to just speak up and share a question, or I know we'd also have a number of uh, Montana bioscience industry folks who are present today. And so some of you may also have uh, your own insights to offer related to what's been shared and that would be welcome too. Um, but please feel free to share if anyone has a question. So chime in. Um, I'm always one with tons of questions. So I have I have some I would I would like to ask as well. Um, so Nicole and Karen, both of you are in a position to work with a broad cross-section of bioscience companies and employers. What are some of the key pain points that you're seeing, um, maybe primarily tied to workforce, but could be other related issues as well, that um, maybe are holding back growth for Montana companies today? Um, it always comes down to talent, facilities and capital, right? Those are the always the three categories of pain points. I think that we can group things in. And I think in Montana, um, definitely talent is is has always been a theme for this industry over the last few years. I think we're the change in and the widespread practice of remote work is certainly something that Montana companies are taking advantage of and using to their advantage. So um, in terms of, you know, being able to hire across, you know, from anywhere in the nation or even outside um, is to their benefit. And that may be easing some of the talent issues. Um, but uh, but certainly in terms of facilities, we know that um, there's there's a real need for more lab space um, and and honestly, many different types of, of commercial space. In Montana, and then um, and then capital will will always be a need, and um, I think we've seen you know a little bit of constriction in uh, the level of capital investment, maybe um, since the pandemic, and um, so yeah, those those are always the pain points. But I'll let I'll let Karen speak to that too. No, I totally agree with you, um, Nicole, and I think that the only thing I could really add is is that. Um, I think there are a number of 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 really talented um, researchers and and people who are are hoping to get into entrepreneurship, but they don't really understand. They don't understand the lingo. They the bar to entry seems too high. So so some of the resources, um, you know, we've we've partnered with Accelerate Montana for this grant, and and we've had a lot of great discussions with them about um, what it looks like to go out and, and get capital, um, and just have those conversations and be able to understand term sheets, and um, so just kind of that baseline education, maybe. Yeah, and I and I think expanding on that, there's a real you know emphasis now in the world of workforce development to turn. You know, we obviously some some credentials and levels of education will always be a requirement, um, especially in this sector where where those credentials are so needed. But there's a real need to kind of break use uh, skills based hiring practices and really look beyond, you know, look and see what what positions really require the credentials that you're asking for in the job description and what maybe you could be more flexible about. Um, and and really turn the emphasis toward the the skills you want a candidate to have rather than maybe the experience or the degrees that you that you want them to apply with and um, and this is something that you know is kind of a nationwide shift in hiring practices that um, 
that I think uh, will we will see more commonly in Montana going forward as the as the talent crunch demographically continues to affect us. I'll pause if anyone else has a question. Um, I, I will jump in. I guess it's more of a comment than a question. Uh, this is Lisa Wallace. I'm Director of Career Services at Rocky Mountain College in Billings. And one thing that I've been paying a lot of attention to in the past couple of years in my part of the, the industry, in my, my process of helping our students find employment, is um, the concept of those skills that you guys are, keep talking about, and it's been mentioned several times, the soft skills. And what I've seen over my career is this disconnect in what employers say they want and what we colleges say we're doing for our students. And really what it comes down to, I think, is that we really are doing the same thing, but we're calling it different things. A business might say, uh, we want someone with critical thinking skills, and they have something in mind when they say that. We we colleges say, oh, we're producing people with critical thinking skills, but we have something different in mind as we say that we're developing that. And so there needs to be some commonality in what phrases we're all using. So an organization that has been trying to bridge that gap is NACE, the National Association of Colleges and Employers. For 15, over 15 years, I think, they've been developing what they call career readiness skills. Uh, and they just launched a new version, uh, uh, after, I mean, and they keep doing research. It's very well-founded. And because they are an association of both colleges and employers, they're working with both sides to develop, here's what we mean when we say critical thinking, or here's what we mean when we talk about um communication skills and, and all the nuances that belong to all of those things. So I would encourage any organization that that is able to, to much of their research is, is very uh, publicly available on their website and or an organization could join NACE to help further those causes because uh, I see our students not understanding what they're prepared for because they don't see they've been for four years studying lab science techniques but then they, they're not necessarily seeing what they think they can do reflected in job postings and they're not sure what they're eligible for and and it it shouldn't be that hard but it has been over the years um any insights or uh Thoughts on that, and, and I'm dealing primarily with undergrad. We don't have any science at the graduate level here at Rocky um, that I work with, but any insights, any thoughts from you or from the rest of the group? Not a whole lot of insights, but a lot of agreements. And as someone who's, you know, kind of watched the evolution of what we call the different skills or even how we the specific terms we use has changed, um, since I've started doing this work about seven years ago. Um, and and so it's great to see like, how, or, you know, national level organizations trying to bring some level of consensus around terminology. Um, and and yeah, and I think I think there's just always going to be a lot of, um, you know, because it's such a diverse industry, because Montana tends to, you know, always be kind of catching up in some ways when it comes to these, you know, nationwide trends in the workforce. Um, I think we're, I think we're kind of always going to be dealing with this issue where, um, where you know, helping of trying to help candidates um, effectively communicate their value to a potential employer. Um, but I do think that um, that we're starting to see more consistency a little bit and more agreement, at least that um, that, you know, those those career readiness skills are um, are are just as valuable and important in many ways as um, as I, mean, I don't know if you would call it the hard skills, <laughs> the the more technical skills, I should say. Mm -hmm. I maybe have a related question for Nicole and Karen and, and anyone else that may want to chime in. 
we are talking a lot across Montana collaboratively about work-based learning and experiential learning and offering more opportunities for, for students, whether it's even at the high school level or into college and beyond, to have apprenticeships, internships, um, projects with employers that give them industry experience or, or hands-on skills and the opportunity to really show what they can do and, and demonstrate some of these soft skills. Do you have any examples of either good case studies of projects that you've seen where these things are being developed or insights into what this could look like in the bioscience and healthcare space? Because it is slightly different from other sectors of tech that we may be working in. Um, what sorts of things would you want to see on someone's resume or do you would you recommend students look to pursue as they're building a resume and a potential career in bioscience? Hmm. I mean, certainly the more, you know, kind of hands on experience a student can get. Um, it's hard to, it's not always easy to get that though in the world of, of either healthcare or bioscience, I would say. And this is an area where our ability to offer this to students, I think was really impacted by the pandemic, just because I know in Missoula, um, I'm on our health science advisory board for uh, one of our high schools. And, um, and during the pandemic, we were not able to offer any kind of, you know, activities for students. Um, the best teachers tell me the best ones are um, are when students actually get out and get to like put their skills into practice, like whether it's like, you know, they they can watch, you know, a cadaver um, being, you know, they can watch, they can actually watch a specific process or procedure and even get to try it themselves, even if it's just like trying to inject an orange or something <laughs> um, or watch someone, di you know, dissect a heart or a pig heart. Um, those are kind of, those those tend to be, the most um the best potential learning opportunities for students and and give them kind of also insights into what it's like to work in the field maybe karen you have something to add here because this is more yeah high school wasn't as long ago for me so i feel like i could speak to my experience kind of working in and, and volunteering in hospitals i spent many many summers um, working on the rehabilitation floor of, of a hospital in Great Falls at, at Benefice um, um, Health System in Great Falls, where I would deliver trays to patients and and sit down and actually do puzzles with them and, and just talk about their lives. So I think that was helpful to me. Um, I think, you know, not necessarily like a training program or anything that you um, could point to, but if someone who was 18 years old, you know, talked about their experience reading how to win friends and influence people and, and talked about, you know, kind of the, the pieces of that that they implemented and, and the changes that they made and the changes that they saw from implementing those interactions. Um, I think that would be really meaningful to me. Yeah, and I, I think the other thing too is like the opportunity to do like capstone projects and turn those into, um, you know, digital badges that kind of show a soft skill that a student can put on their LinkedIn profile and their resume. That's been an initiative I know at the University of Montana. So more of a, but I haven't really seen that kind of, um, that kind of effort get into the high schools yet. Um, but, but I, I think we will, we will see that um, if we can come up with kind of a standard digital badging system, which I think is sort of another whole kettle of fish but um but but certainly those kind of projects and giving you know giving students the opportunity to do a hands-on project turn in a you know turn in a body of work and then translate that into specific skills that they can list I think seems to be pretty impactful unfortunately that's hard to it's it's hard to see the bandwidth to do that in the k-12 level right now with the current level of um kind of career career service CTE um, support that we currently have. There's just, at least in Missoula, I, maybe, which is what I know best. One uh, strength that I have observed in our Montana University system too, is that 
many under many labs at the universities involve undergraduates and research and will recruit and hire and support um, students during their studies in groundbreaking research and and many of our entrepreneurs who have built innovative biotech companies here got their start at UM or MSU or other colleges in Montana um, in those labs. And so that's also a fertile ground of experience and, and something that's very related. Are there any final questions from our audience for our panelists or observations for each other? I have one final question, um, Nicole and Karen. I have also observed that um, on the frontiers of, of bioscience, we're often seeing skills like that you mentioned earlier, Nicole, like computer science or data analytics that are emerging as really crucial tools to um, drive innovation or drive um, progress in medical technology, healthcare technology. Can you speak to those skills or any other skills that you see as emerging and important where a student who maybe has interests in both worlds of, you know, some of these technology or, or analytic skills and healthcare might be able to merge them fruitfully in a future opportunity? Yes, definitely. I think Data analytics is definitely a, a skill that, you know, is taking over kind of every industry and valuable in many ways to multiple industries. The other one that um, that that uh, that uh, CSBI and Techonomy report recently really highlighted was artificial intelligence as being um, at the forefront of a, of a big uh, you know, may have uh, big implications for bioscience and biotech and being a skill that will be in demand in the future. So, um, so yeah, and Karen. <laughs> no, I agree. I um, uh, was something that I tried to do when I was finishing up my pharmacy degree was to supplement it a little bit with um, more more advanced biostatistical analysis. And, and that's actually how I got my start um, in the industry was was taking on kind of independent contractor like work um, doing data analytics for clinical trials um, and then expanded that beyond to, to more of the um, broader clinical or contract research organization services. That's great. Well, thank you to Nicole and Karen, to Cassandra and Brigitte and the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative for partnering with us today. And if you're interested in a deep dive into Montana's burgeoning bioscience industry, either for your own information or to share with others, the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative has partnered with the Montana High Tech Business Alliance to create a landing page of Montana biotech resources, which you can see here. Uh, this page includes current information from organizations like the Montana World Trade Center and the Montana Bioscience Alliance, as well as an archive of resources developed by the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative over the last five years. So a link uh, to these resources and a recording of today's presentation will be uh, emailed to everyone who registered. We can maybe also share it in the chat quickly if um, folks would like to click on the link. And you can also find it through our website at mthitech.org under resources. Uh, you can also find recordings of this webinar and future uh, or past webinars are available. We've done several of these events with the Bioscience Cluster Initiative over the last few years. So there's a rich archive of, of additional content if you're interested. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you so much to our speakers and hosts. <laughs>